Um, this, this is about large-scale brain initiatives in terms of investment and, and manpower. But I wanted to start off and just quickly review um, how this all started. In, in fact, the Allen Institute was really one of the first uh, efforts in, you know, in, in this decade to make a significant commitment and a significant investment in doing large-scale neuroscience. Uh, so this was in 2012, they announced their uh, Project Mindscope, and we're very happy, of course, as part of this meeting on uh, Saturday uh, in the Australian Node session that we'll have some representatives of the Allen Institute uh, talking about some of their latest atlasing work. You'll hear in this session about the Human Brain Project uh, with Richard Frokoviak, uh, which was awarded in 2013, so this is the European initiative to build a large-scale collaborative infrastructure for neuroscience, medicine, and computing. We'll also hear uh, from Walter Koroshetz uh, talking about the US Brain Initiative, which came along shortly after the Human Brain Project was announced. And then we'll hear also from Japan and on our, on our own INCF Japanese node uh, talking about the Brain Minds Project uh, from Japan and these are the three uh, main recently funded projects, but there are others, and I want to give us a sense of that because this is a, an important moment in history where around the world, every few months it seems, every year at least, we're getting new large-scale investments made by individual governments or groups of governments. And uh, in fact, in Korea, there's been a significant commitment uh, to, to funding the Korean Brain Research Institute over a number of years and, and really looking at doing multidisciplinary brain research. In China, um, as, as many of you may have heard, there's an underdevelopment, it's not yet announced, but there is a large scale, maybe, maybe 15 year uh, project being planned to be financed and, and in principle will have three components at least in basic neuroscience and brain disorders and in brain-like technology. So we're looking forward to hearing what happens there. And uh, of course in Australia as well, there was a proposal published um, pr proposing a $250 million Australian effort to fund and model the brain. Uh, that has not yet been funded, but there's, there's uh, discussions underway and, and hopefully we'll see something emerging. And I also just wanted to point out there are different types of large-scale international collaborative projects. And one of them that we're involved with is supported by One Mind for Research, which is a, a group in the United States, a philanthropic organization, which has actually helped fund the development of the infrastructure for a large-scale traumatic brain injury project. And what's important about this is that this is establishing a standardized infrastructure that's now being deployed around the world, not just within the Center TBI European project, but it's also been being deployed in the United States for, for track TBI. It's also now been launched in China with 40 sites in China using the same standardization, standardized protocol, uh, ECRFs, the, so the standardized case report forms, and a, a whole common infrastructure which allows this data to be combined with data from around the world. And then we're looking at expanding that to India. So there are these opportunities that are emerging and being facilitated uh, to create other types of large-scale initiatives that are not necessarily um, at the a scale of, of you know, millions and uh, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of investment, but are actually being deployed at very large scale to get very large scale standardized patient data. And then I wanted to just briefly mention that there is, uh, in the planning stages, but it, it is planned to happen around OHBM next year in Geneva, an initiative to bring together the various international brain projects to discuss how they can contribute to public health and how can they have an impact on public health. So that's in, in, uh, jointly organized with the World Health Organization and OHBM. And so the, just to, to summarize, I mean, we really see that as INCF is moving into this new phase where we, we have the resources to help seed collaborations between researchers around the world, we also hope to act as an as a organization that can help facilitate interactions between the community and these large-scale brain initiatives where there are these large investments being made all around the world. And so we really uh, 
look forward to working with you in the community, but also uh, the leaders of these projects. And with that, I wanted to then introduce our first speaker, uh, which is Professor Richard Frakowiak. Um, so Richard has a, a, a very uh, rich and uh, <laughs> very rich Richard career. <clears throat> um, he's he's actually recently retired, so I can I can make fun of him a little bit. But now he's what is he going to do with himself? But he's actually one of the most highly cited neuroscientists and. Um, currently, and he's been a major pioneer in brain imaging. Uh, he recently, in his, in his last stage of his career, led the neurology uh, unit at the Cantonal Hospital in Lausanne. And he's a co-director in the Human Brain Project, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing about the medical informatics efforts in the Human Brain Project from Richard. Turn me a volume up, would you? Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. So, um, I'm neither an informaticist, nor a physicist, nor an anatomist. I'm a neurologist. A, a breed called cl clinical scientist. And um, what I'm going to do t today is to, because this talk is a bit, bit long, I usually talk for five minutes, but after a time, and I've increased to 50. Uh, it's, yeah, oh, it's happened again, has it? Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Is that right? Oh, that's it. That's it for there. I wanted the one with the timings on it. Hang on a moment. That's my one up there, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you very much. You're really kind. All right, let's go. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Human Brain Project, one arm of it. The Human Brain Project has three arms. There's a neuroscience arm, a medical science arm, and a medical technology arm, or neuromorphic commu uh, com com computing. And it, b because it's so large, I'm going to concentrate on the one bit that I know best, but I'm going to give you uh, insights from that as to what the rest is doing and how we interact with each other as we go along. It's very important to say at the beginning that it's a big project because it is composed of what is a relatively new culture in biological science and neuroscience. It moves from the PI with his postdocs and doctoral students fighting the guy across the corridor, corridor working on the same problem, to 70 institutions, 150 PIs, in non-competitive, collaborative mode, going towards a single aim. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a different way of working, and it's, it's basis is the fact that no one brain, in fact no one computer can hold all the information that we need in order to solve the current problems we have in neuroscience. And so you need lots of experts. And you'll see me rabbiting on about this as we go along. Now there are a number of motivations purely from the clinical neuroscience side which uh, have, have contributed to launching the Human Brain Project. And th there are essentially two major ones. The first is the aging population. As the population ages, so the number of people who become disabled by neurological degeneration increases in absolute terms. At the age of 80, about 20% of people are disabled and need help from someone else from neurodegenerative disease of one sort or another, the commonest cause being the syndrome of dementia. Remember that word, syndrome. It's a number of symptoms and signs which come together which a clinician understands. It says nothing about the cause. It says nothing about the underlying pathology. It says nothing very much about the treatment, though people often think it does. It's a way of classifying a way in which an abnormal brain manifests itself. The second reason is that there is another major group of brain diseases which affect young people. And that group of brain diseases is extremely badly understood, has been treated using the stories of Mr. Freud for 120 years, and about which we know virtually no, none of the biology, and which are the psychiatric diseases. And some of these diseases are fatal, 
to the patient or to people who are with the patient. Uh, some of these diseases are so disabling that the sufferers never work and so are continually um, being supported by the state or by their families. So these are two major areas of brain disease which really need cracking and we're getting nowhere. In psychiatric disease, one drug, haloperidol, in 1953 by Baron Janssen, a Belgian, discovered by him the basis of most of what has happened in psychiatric therapy of a biological type since then. Now, I'm exaggerating for effect, but I'm certainly talking the truth. So that's the first reason. The second motivation is this one about how do we get at the information we need in order to design good experiments and take knowledge forward. We are, as a discipline, extremely good at taking facts forward. We're even better at creating new methods. We have some amazing methods. We can see single calcium ions going through ion channels. We saw today examples of very rapid EM and reconstruction of EM of tiny brains, of big brains, of little brains, transparent brains, and so on. We are each of us super, super experts in one little area, and we are governed by a way of being funded, which means we have to know what we're going to find before we get the funds. And we also work with a method which has been extremely successful in material science, the reductionist method, but which in terms of understanding organic matter, how it's organized, and how it's organized in order to generate emergent properties such as consciousness, feelings, and so on and so on, is probably pretty useless. And even if we wanted to use the reductionist method, as we heard from our distinguished Chinese colleague today, it would take us at least 30 years to do one little piece of that. So there are clearly showstoppers there which we have to crack through and understand how to go through. Now the principal aim of the Human Brain Project and of the Medical Informatics platform of that is to try and understand the rules which govern the relationship between DNA and emergent properties. So this is an issue of spatial scale in the first instance, temporal scale in the second instance. Spatial scale will require exabyte computing and so on. Temporal scale added to that will magnify the problem greatly, and we don't yet know how that will be done. So the first aim is to try and understand how quite a simple molecule, DNA, transforms into what we're doing today, highly social communication with transfer of knowledge, making us, at least uh, in evolutionary terms, one of the most successful um, species there are. Now, <coughs> in thinking about how to break through our problems, uh, the impact of uh, informatics and computing science uh, you know, comes right up to the forefront. And, and the most astonishing thing about it is how little uh, medicine and, and medical science and how little neuroscience has actually used modern informatics and modern computer science of all the disciplines. I mean, some of you will have read how the creation of the universe from 30,000 years after the Big Bang has been modeled now in nature last year, and the end results look very similar to what we see using the Hubble telescope in scanning mode. Um, we all know uh, how the Apple uh, um, telephone tells us what the weather will be like in a couple of hours' time. I'm of the generation that if it could tell you what was going to happen in 10 seconds' time, that was uh, uh, already incredible. Uh, and what happened in a week was always wrong, so you took the opposite to be correct. All this is due to the fact that computing uh, has, uh, over the last 20 years, simply exploded. Big data analyses are giving us objects which are now becoming the subjects of our hypotheses. They're becoming the hypotheses themselves. We're actually going into the mode where the hypothesis doesn't come from the mind, but it comes from the data and the data themselves are generators of the most um, profound hypotheses that we're beginning to discover. Now, this has led to a situation where 
we've got a number, an enormous number of results as well as an enormous uh, uh, amount of data. And coming from imaging, um, for me, one of the principal issues is going to be how we understand the new knowledge that we generate. And one of, one of the ways that this is going to happen is that um, we're going to use images as transmitters of knowledge as well as simple illustrators of results. So it's very important when you come from medicine not to consider simply the radiological aspects of a brain, which you can look at now in ways that were impossible in normal subjects before 1973, when the first uh, CT scanner came into use. These ways of looking at the human brain, diseased or normal, have greatly increased our powers of therapy and, above all, our powers of diagnosis. They depend on pattern recognition by experts. And as such, the enormous amount of information there is simply subsampled in minute uh, way. Uh, we've heard today also about how you can make brains transparent and how you can find individual cells and follow their, 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 uh, their, their connections down to deeper parts of the brain, uh, a sort of transparent Golgi. But you can also imagine um, images like this, which are conveying the information in the structure of the rodent brain and over time projecting it through to what the human brain now looks like and giving information about evolutionary aspects of brain development. Now, the images themselves on their own uh, tap only into your visual recognition, but if you can add onto each voxel element in those images other information that comes from other aspects of neuroscience or from even from aspects of material science and developmental science and so on and so on, you begin to create knowledge atlases which really can then transform the way you think about how the brain is constructed. And all the little pieces of knowledge that we've been generating over the 30, 35 years, we've had neuroscience as a discipline, will come together into some sort of structure or framework which will depend on how each level of scale relates to and determines the next level of scale up. It sort of reduces the whole problem of how organic matter is constructed from something that seems to be impossible to understand to something where you say to yourself, well, there are certain rules about how DNA creates, RNA creates, proteins, how those proteins are distributed, that at each stage limits what is possible at the next level of organization. And that, it is that which we're going to try to uh, tackle on the neuroscience side with the computing, high performance computing side through simulation to try and create a model, if you like, of the whole brain, a very rough model in the first instance, onto which all the pieces of information can be hung and can be understood in relation to each other. So informatics and connectomics, which we heard quite a lot about earlier today, uh, we heard about the structural side um, in radiology and, and, and also some of the work we heard about today, the tractography at the microscopic level. Some, something about the functional connectivity, but not an awful lot. Uh, and the effective connectivity, the difference between the two is important. Functional connectivity means areas of the brain whose function is related in some simple way one to the other, um, often uh, uh, correlated or anti-correlated or something similar. Whereas effective connectivity means that connection from some other third element which drives the connectivity in the other elements to, um, to be correlated with each other. So one has no causality involved with it, the second has causality involved with it. And there are various advances in mathematical modeling which have been driven by the advances in computing power which I was showing you about earlier which now allow us to solve really very complex questions, multidimensional questions of causality using highly complex data. Oh, that was interesting, wasn't it? No, that's wrong as well. Sorry about this. This is uh, Where did I go? There. Uh -huh. Lovely. So, how are we going to uh, use all these, uh, these these, these issues. So first thing, first, 
let's start thinking about uh, how informatics helped us to integrate data. Let, I'm going to use just a, a few examples from imaging, which is my discipline. Um, one of the ways in which the connectomics people are trying to discover how different parts of the brain are related to each other is ab initio. So taking one area of the brain, saying now, do I find using this or this technique, often MRI techniques in the human brain, does it link to this part of the brain, to the other part of the brain? There are now methods for trying to see whether one part of the brain links to lots of other parts of the brain, just in simple terms. Another way of doing this is to try and get some information in there first in order to lead the way. Um, so here we see a, a little study that was performed by, in fact, one of my last PhD students who said to himself, well, there's at least 30 years worth of work in the literature in, in NIH and the Public Library of Science, which tells us what people have found about the connections of the subthalamic nucleus. They're interested in the subthalamic nucleus because the treatment of Parkinson's can depend on putting electrodes very accurately into the subthalamic nucleus and switching these electrodes on in order to stop trembling and in order to speed up movement. Now, he simply used the MASH um, indices for uh, cortical and subcortical areas. And he looked, using the algorithms that are readily available on, s on, on the website, uh, how many papers he could find that correlated subthalamic nucleus in its various compartments with all other areas of the brain. And came up with a large set of papers which could then be analyzed further to show, as you see on this diagram, an image which brings that information together. And it brings that information together from the subthalamic unit, from, uh, nucleus from its anterior and external parts to all other parts of the brain in which it has been reported in the past, in the human brain. And as you can see, there are very many. There are very many, and some of them are efferent in blue, some of them are afferent in red, some of them appear to contain both afferent and efferent compartments. And then he was able to look at these functional connections in space. So to put them out in spatial arrangement, putting the subcortical regions here and the uh, subthalamic nucleus here, and he began to see that various compartments showed afferent fibers together, efferent fibers together, going out to the cortex. And these could be correlated subsequently, again using the same papers, to the various components of the, uh, uh, that were associated with the afferent and efferent parts, but which were also associated with particular behaviors. So the behaviors in blue here represent those that are primarily behaviors associated with motor structures and motor memories. The red ones with limbic structures to do with uh, emotions and the associative structures in order to do with motor limbic projections. So using this simple parcellation on the basis of past knowledge, all the little bits of knowledge that were scattered throughout, which it had taken him years to find and years to read through and so on, he was able then to look with MRI tractography at each of these connections and see how relevant they were in the human, how big they are, how small they are, are they present, and are there in the human neurological literature any indications as to what each of the individual connections might lead to. So this is one way in which one can summarize information that is already present. There is an awful lot of information already present. But in order to do these things, of course, you must also advance the methodologies and the relevant methodologies. So here is some more recent work from MRI showing how the classical concept of taking an image, usually an anatomical image, which means it's T1 weighted, looking at things like volume, thickness, area, and so on, in one set of subjects in a control set of subjects and then making statistical inferences and interpretations, that's what most people do at the present time, to try and begin to bring quantitation into this whole subject. Take it away from pure radiology to something that is more quantitative and related to physical aspects that underlie the brain. So here there are various, various what they call sequences, what we call sequences of 
collecting the imaging data with the same machine in the same subject in the same 10 minutes, proton density, magnetization, transfer, and so on and so on, related to the biological aspects of water diffusion, myelin integrity, um, iron content, uh, and so on, and measure them in such a way that the measurements from each voxel can be compared not only to this subject at another time, but to another subject in another laboratory. In other words, creating real quantitative images of these biologically relevant measurements, where interpretation then, of course, becomes much easier. So we need high-performance computing in order to analyze these sorts of data, to bring these multiple variables together to interact with the information that we had a priori. The other thing that informatics and high-performance computing and the mathematical advances that it's, that it's caused have brought to us is the sort of statistics we now need in order to deal with these highly complex issues of interactions, changes in function with different contexts, which is a question that arose before, and so on. So the whole area of machine learning, machine learning as a statistical um, classifier, support vector machines as an exemplar of this, just to show you, in the past, when a radiologist looked at an image of the human brain with dementia, he was capable of saying it's atrophied, it's not atrophied. He was not capable of saying whether the atrophy was normal for that age or not normal for that age. He was not capable of predicting whether the patient had dementia or didn't have dementia without that knowledge, and was not capable of making a differential diagnosis of the different causes of dementia. Here, by taking a, a group, an exemplar group of people who had died, had had MRI scans beforehand, who either were completely normal, no changes of Alzheimer's disease, even though they were very old, or they had only Alzheimer's disease, and using those to create a support vector machine, we've been able to increase correct classification of a patient's condition from an error rate of 35% in the best hospitals in the world to an error rate of around, uh, around 5% from one single scan rather than the week's worth of uh, workup in the hospital. Uh, this, this was the clinical score and this was the single scan score. So we're now in an extremely interesting situation where informatics is refining our diagnostic analyses as well. So if we take the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, the ADNI uh, data, that classify scans using clinical knowledge as well, using genetics sometimes, as Alzheimer's or normal controls, and then look at the same using the support vector machine on a single scan, we see that there are inconsistencies in the results with sensitivities of 75% and specificities of 85% for the clinical ADNI data set, which must be one of the greatest data sets that has ever been created yet in clinical science, of uh, clinical, uh, clinical neuroscience. So we can begin to really begin to really explore what's happening in life in the human with a one millimeter cubed um, uh, resol spatial resolution by using techniques which are using more and more refinements that come from informatics. Now, I keep going on about these refinements that I come to my motivation three, which is the discovery of causes of disease. Be it psychiatric disease or be it the dementias, we do not know what the causes are. That the most we've been practicing lamppost neuroscience, let me give you an example of that. In, in dementia, as I've mentioned already, if you take the pathology as the endpoint, we make in life a 40%, 35% error rate in the best hospitals with a week's workup in the hospital of the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease as a cause of dementia. But we don't even know the cause of Alzheimer's disease. We find things in the brain. Some of them are very easy to find. There's a thing called amyloid, which you hear about even in the popular press. The nice thing about amyloid is you take a, a, a dye called Congo Red, you pour it on the brain, you wash it off, you can see the amyloid. You hardly need a, a, a microscope. Anyone can do that. So amyloid becomes the center of everyone's focus of interest. It's probably a tombstone. We've tried to get rid of it, nothing happens. We've done it in animal models, done it in humans. We've killed a few humans, we've killed lots of animals. 
You know, it, it, it doesn't seem to be primarily an amyloid problem anymore. 10 years of work, 15 for some. Theory's been around for a long time. 10 billion, if not more, invested by pharma. We can't go on like this. Well, perhaps we can, because this gentleman was demented when he ran the world. Um, if you, very interesting. Go to the social sciences who do data mining of text the best, much better than we do data mining of text. Right, so when they do data mining of the text of his speeches, it's quite clear there are lots of incongruities that change over time as he becomes demented, as he says silly things, as he doesn't construct sentences properly. Uh, why aren't we doing similar things uh, on some of our biological variables? We have EGs, we have physiology, we have uh, scanners, we have uh, blood tests, we have genetic uh, tests, we have deep uh, exome screening, etc., etc., etc. And what do we do with them? We ask someone with experience who goes on a world round to interpret them in the light of what the patient says. And you know what the patient says when he's demented? He says he's fine, thank you very much. He doesn't know he's demented. He doesn't remember he was demented. That's how they present. They come with their wife or husband who says, he's going off his rocker. And the patient says, well, I don't know what I'm doing. Is she, he brought me. So, so the whole problem is a profound problem, and we do need new ways of tackling it. So it boils down in the end to a confrontation of scientific paradigms, essentially. Uh, and many of us have been brought up in the Cartesian model, a nice top-down model, where well, you have a mental theory, we think in four dimensions. I just remind you that a single brain scan has 100,000 dimensions. So there's no way we can conceive of it. But we conceive of a theory of the cause of schizophrenia or dementia. We mathematically express a model of it. We confront it with the relevant data. We tweak the parameters to optimize the model. And we have a model which we consider a fact. What we are now potentially capable of doing using a simulation approach, bottom up, is to use multimodal, multivariate data, mine it to demonstrate structures or correlations or classifications, mathematically express those structures, explore them to generate hypotheses, investigate those hypotheses using the classical method. And then we would have knowledge. And with knowledge in the context of a relevant theory, a global theory, then we will have a way forward. So how are we doing this with the medical informatics platform? So the first thing is that we believe that there is a very large amount of data out there. Um, every hospital has a very large amount of data, highly protected, protected for privacy, protected for against corruption, um, standing in servers or, or data stores for the benefit of lawyers and uh, an 8% estimated benefit for patients, those who come up for repeat in the same, uh, with the same illness uh, where their previous results have relevance to them in context of treatment or in context of being followed. And we're spending a very large amount of money on that. All the people involved, all the hardware involved, doing nothing with it. So somehow we have to federate those data, and then because they come from all sorts of areas, be they behavior, neuropsychology, brain imaging, and so on, we have to integrate them, genetics, proteomics, and then we need to mine them to do some causal modeling on the basis of previous knowledge and in order to simulate, to give us a new set, a new catalog of disease definition not a catalog that is based purely on symptoms and signs, because some people can't tell you their symptoms and signs, and then there are some pretty lousy doctors around, and then some of them can't write, and some of them are dementing as well. <laughs> Including me, I was going to say, I hit myself. And on the other hand, we have a vast amount of data about biological features of these diseases that we're not using in a systematic fashion. And so we want to bring those two together to give us then some insights from these more systematized pieces of information about new, dr new drug targets, um, creating cohorts for clinical trials which are much purer than the 
just imagine you're a pharmacologist and you've got a drug which you think treats Alzheimer's disease. You go and find a group of Alzheimer's disease. I've already told you, your error variance there is already 35% before you even start. And then you go and look for a control group, age matched, everything matched. But you don't know whether they are compensating or not. In fact, 20% of them already have Alzheimer change. So uh, the error variance is massive. So you're going to need a massive trial, which is fine if your drug's going to work. But if it doesn't work, you've lost a lot of money and your reputation. And you're going to go and look for another drug target, and you're not going to know why you're looking for it here or there or anywhere else. And these definitions we're calling biological signatures of disease. Now, what are the data sources that we have, and what are the challenges that we've had to tackle? We have two sets of data. We have clinical data, which is very poor quality and very, very large in volume, sitting there highly protected. And then we have research data, which is of small volume and very high quality in many cases, which is sitting there waiting for you to win your Nobel Prize because you're protecting it. Thank God for the Allen Institute, which just publishes its data as it comes off the uh, measurement. So we have hospital databases, neither complete, structured, standardized, or clean, protected for privacy and protected against corruption. We have research databases that are protected culturally. That's by us, because we're paranoid. And pharmaceutical databases, which are protected commercially. Let's think about each of those. You can deal with privacy absolutely by aggregating data. So the first strategy today, we couldn't care less about individuals. We're going to try and get knowledge about groups and look at tendencies and trends across the population rather looking at individual points. So in that situation, we can depersonalize and aggregate data, and then it's impossible to come back to the individual. In terms of consent, it's becoming more and more clear that the public wants effective clinical research and is agreeable to the notion of com broad consent for research on things like samples of blood, genetics, and so on. As long as they know it can't get, come back to me personally, and they couldn't care less once your blood has been taken, your cells have been taken, your scan has been done, they couldn't care less whether you use it for ideas you've had before you've taken the samples or ideas you have subsequently. And that's been repeated in many societies and in many places, and it is becoming accepted. And then there's the management of ethics, what sort of questions and so on. Well, we have a very strong network of local ethics committees that give a lot of value and credibility to science in the population, already in place. So what's the solution? The solution, therefore, is to keep the data where they are. And someone has already mentioned this at some stage. Oh, you did in an email to me. Keep the data where they are. Keep them under the control of the people who control them now, the hospitals, the scientists, and so on, and see what you can do with that. So every hospital, every scientist has his database. And they hate to think that that might become corrupted or it might be stolen. So they have an archive off-site. We want another archive copy in real time of every hospital database. This is ambitious, by the way. We're going to start slowly. And that archive will be pre-processed to denoise it, standardize it, normalize it anatomically, normalize it numerically. So it doesn't matter as long as there's lots and lots and lots of the data whether it's precisely structured and so on and so on, because the noise will disappear under the weight of the data. From that, we will select, on the basis of queries, the data to be used in each research experiment. So the data will all remain on site. The original database will be neither copied, nor moved, nor corruptible. And the data will be selected on the basis of queries, transferred into a holding position where it will be aggregated, encrypted, and filtered for anonymization once more. And then under secure transfer, 
go to a unified portal where the experimenter will receive the result of his query or her query. Now, the data will be used to refine disease diagnosis, to visualize scientific disease, and for further analysis of a public health or epidemiological type. And when the answers are obtained, they will be always associated with provenance, an archive of everything that's been done to the data, where it's come from, and so on. And that provenance history will be stored to be able to redo the analysis if required, to show that it's reproducible. And the data that came out of the hospital, even though aggregated, will be deleted. So this is the informatics platform as it has been conceived and as it's now been put into practice at the Shuv in Lausanne from A to Z. And the team at the moment is writing the software to make that single line of algorithms scalable to multiple sites. It's been done in principle in the sense that the original data have been put on four different servers and it's been made to run. And now we want four different sites with all the associated problems of moving data across very large um, distances and uh, from lots of different areas. Data collection, so far we've got quite a lot of laboratory results and patients, as you can see. A lot of clinical data with a lot of textual diagnostic labels. We have data from ADNI, all the data from ADNI. The Three Cities database, which is a large general population in the west coast of France. Two further German projects are currently um, interacting, the LIFE project and the German uh, FTLD network. And then there is a lot of clinical trial data also from Shuf patients and also from a drug company called Sanofi. When it was explained to them that if they gave the data from their failed trials, which of course there are many, from the placebo arm, which therefore is not contaminated by a chemical, though it can be contaminated by the state of mind of placebo, then that has no commercial value and could be given readily. They've given these data, and that's now proof of concept that this can actually happen. So we have a large amount of data which we're playing with. We're recruiting hospitals. The hospital in Freiburg and Grisel has joined. National Health Service of the United Kingdom is joining with its Institute of Psychiatry and Neurology. The Salpetria Hospital of Neurology in Paris is joining. We're going to approach the Aachen Hospital for its psychiatric population, which is massive and controls most of the patients in Germany, and from the Niguada Hospital in Milan, which is a large northern uh, Italian hospital uh, in, in, a, in a major university. Those five, six university hospitals will be the first network, when we can then prove in principle and in practice that that network functions, then we will open the whole thing up to commercial exploitation. So what will the researcher's perspective be? They'll sit at the unified portal, accredited. There'll be security in place. There'll be an entry point. The Researcher will, s will see all the data as though on one server, but actually distributed throughout, just like I do when I use Google. Uh, we'll be able to, through the Federation, at each hospital, send the query so that the Federation will send the query out to all the hospitals. They will pick out the relevant pieces of data and send them back to the unified portal, where the, the data will go back and can be visualized, analyzed, or diagnostics can be performed with the store on which all this depends in each hospital within its firewall, controlled by its information safety officer or controlling officer, whatever you like. So that the store will involve extracting information from the primary data, anonymizing, converting, creating raw data files which the Data Federation query client will go down and interact with directly, never being put into a database. 
We couldn't lo load all these uh, data into a database system because of the many files, the many formats, the need to integrate with legacy software, the privacy-related limitations I've talked about, and the fact that the data are owned by the database systems when you load them up in. So we're using this new concept developed by my colleague Anastasia Lamarki at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale in Lausanne of NoDB, where the queries are in situ on the raw data files running directly over the files. So this is a sort of data virtualization and harmonization in situ, which is done by the queries. Something which, in principle, is similar to what Google does, though in many details it's quite different. The data don't have to be moved or copied. Large collections of files can be integrated. If one node falls down, the rest continues, just as if site on the web falls down, doesn't mean the whole web falls down. It could accommodate multiple data formats. Doctors won't have to change their way of working, necessarily. Scientists will continue to be paranoid if they wish, but they won't be able to have access to the network if they don't give up their data. The contract there will be, you join, you give up your data, you get access to everyone else's data. That's a win-win situation. The patients will have doctors. The doctors, and they will have a contract. The doctor will say to the patient, I'm going to send your data set, your vector, to the new way of diagnosing uh, brain disease, and we'll get back some ideas as to what you're like. Do you agree? That's what they do now. Doctors will continue to work like doctors. So the real issue now is whether, with all these external data, we can be comparable with database performance. So the queries will need high performance. We're retaining the data formats, the files, the scripts, using this NoDB concept. Here are some preliminary results as to the time it takes, execution time, where there are 1 to 150 queries using CSV or JSON data where, as you can see, the loading onto the database, loading into the uh, data store, time used for flattening are estimated in different contexts. These are classical contexts. These are slightly less classical, more advanced contexts, and this is no DB. You can see that there's major, um, almost tenfold increase in sensitivity, and so we get to a stage where uh, we think we're in business. So what are we going to do with these data just for the last 10 minutes? The first thing that we need to do is to try and get these dis disease signatures right. Let me just uh, Im Im get you to imagine what that means. Imagine the brain disease space, highly multidimensional, about 300 uh, diagnostic labels in DSM-5 uh, in neurology and about 250 in psychiatry. So there are at least that many dimensions, and probably a factor of 10 more, um, because there's a lot of lumping goes on. So we need a lot of hospitals, a lot of databases involved, and there needs to be a whole real-time, continuous, iterative data mining procedure going on in the background. So this will generate the new multidimensional diagnostic catalog which will be what the doctor will compare your disease vector with in order to find where you lie in that disease data space. This is not something for Thayer saying, oh, will you be studying Parkinson's disease? Of course, we have to study all diseases. The trick here is that the messier the diagnostic labels, the messier, the more diseases there are, the better, because you draw them apart in the disease space you get the bigger contrasts. The bigger the contrast, the better. It's, it's difficult to get across as a concept quite frequently. Then, for data visualization, the standard things, graphs and, and, and so on, ideal for epidemiological research, ideal for health services research, depending on individual questions and the whole set of data. And finally, classical research, the research that will arise from data mining of this type on subsets of the diseases, which generate objects which can then be related to this issue of uh, where the disease has its greatest impact in, in space, at what level, and so on and so on. 
This, this has been done very simply by a postdoc in half a day in the Blue Brain Project Lab. Um, again, on the National Library of Science. In this case, all papers that mention both gen a genetic aspect and a brain disease. And, and this is, uh, you can't see this, but all this shows is that with a half a day's work, you can show that the diseases in these catalogs do f cluster. They cluster in relation to the genetics, which are the little spots. And the clustering makes sense. This image doesn't make sense because it's in two dimensions and it's representing a very multidimensional space. But it makes sense in, the sen in, in that it shows that clusters occur. So the power of data mining in showing up these clusters, which are then the pro the, the, what, what the hypotheses will be built on, is very major. And we have some preliminary data for data integration. Here, a whole set of brain imaging, clinical scales and measurements, 500,000 to a million SNPs on some of the patients, proteins in the CSF and the blood in some of the patients. Um, all put together, MRI data, PET data, gene data, CSF data, protein data, clinical data, in over 500, in over 5,000 controls and almost uh, 1,000 patients with uh, dementia. Sorry, this should be dementia, not Alzheimer's disease. And we've, we've used this to phenotype, lead, so dementia, type of dementia-led semi-supervised clustering. We've used biologically-led, completely random uh, uh, start data mining, high dim dimension and feature learning in order to try and cluster them. And this is, this is the preliminary result. The first thing you see is that there are a lot of clusters. The red clusters are demented people clinically, so those with a syndrome of dementia. The big cluster in the middle with the two people looks like it's Alzheimer's disease because to be in that cluster, you have to have the MRI and the PET pattern of loss of brain function and structure in the frontal and parietal and hippocampal regions. You have to have APOE4 um, in your genotype. You have to have the um, amyloid precursor protein gene in your haplotype. The blue ones are all normals. And as you see, there are different groups of normals which if you accept that there are, and you have to accept that there are normals who are normal normal, there are normals who are normal but have Alzheimer's change and so therefore compensated normals, there are normals who age rapidly, there are normals who age slowly, and so on and so on. We're beginning to see associations also of genes specifically with one group and not with another, haplotypes of one group and not with another. Now, there's a big caveat here, which is that there are only 5,000 data points. To do real data mining, you need a million, two million, three million. What you will get when you try to federate and integrate the whole set of data that are available to us through our socialized healthcare systems in Europe. So this is the way forward. Visualization can take a number of uh, uh, formats. This is another format which is concentrating on the structural side and associating it with different patterns. You can see how some diseases appear to have satellites, other diseases appear to be uh, very uh, solitary, like this one with just a number of different haplotypes associated with it. So there, are, there, there is information here, a lot of information here, which bears looking at. And then in this demo, you can see how you can begin to bring together the clinical data with that. These are categories from the DSM-5 catalog of diseases. And as we go through, you can find the categories. You can show how many you've got in the patients. There were 57,000 patients. Uh, there you saw 9,200 with uh, vascular disease. That are, this is the major categories. These are subcategorized. These are the smallest uh, types of categories. You can type in the name of, di of a disease. You could then see how many of that disease are present. 454 dements that year in Shuv, 57 of those. Uh, were vascular dements. You can start plotting the males and the females uh, with the different uh, categories found in the notes. One then has to recluster them according to the biology. And that, for that, we will need the biological information as well. Here you have the uh, display over age. Uh, here is 70, here is 60. Um, and here you uh, begin to look at the associated uh, clinical features. So. Um, hypercholesterolemia associated with high blood pressure, associated with other things, 
in these patients. There's one very interesting one where you see early Alzheimer's disease, which comes up with, um, uh, w with urinary tract infections. Fascinating. People with just early dementia, if they get an infection, they usually go blonk, lose their cognitive profiles. You treat them with antibiotics, bump, up they come back to their compensated state. So these sorts of associations uh, can be uh, you know, readily visualized, and I won't go into that any further. The critical things that remain to be done are how to extract the data, how to, what sort of features to extract for something as complex as this, which has 100,000 different data points. It, it, should one use all those 100,000 points to make the computations more complex, or should one extract features such as individual areas? Um, all sorts of issues which will need to have to be uh, um, sorted out. Uh, for data integration to be successful and efficient. So the integrated view of the medical informatics platform is that we have a work package that deals with federated data ma management, its acquisition and its federation, for data query and data capture purposes, integration and operation with users and community outreach, hospital recruitment and ethics, which are critical to the workings of the platform itself, the medical intelligence tools for data categorization for the mining, with the curation of the data, uh, data workflows, how to relate data from one uh, country and one hospital to another in terms of ontologies, and the scientific coordination and management of all of this. That's been going for 20 months now. We've got another 14 months in the ramp-up phase, and uh, we hope to be there with the five hospitals at the end of that. What I've described to you is this. There's the future computing and the future neuroscience to come. And all of these will manifest themselves to you as six open platforms, open to everyone, anyone, as long as you buy into the contract. I give, I get. Um, so this is something to keep an eye on. We interact with the other major brain uh, initiatives. We interact with some of the major institutes, like the Allen. And uh, in the end, the final issue is how to construct a blueprint for the brain at all spatial scales by simulation, the ultimate connection set, the ultimate connectome, because it includes everything, not just structure, not just function, and so on. It talks about the ultimate connection set from base pairs to cognition. And it will give us the link between the medical informatics platform and the neuroscience platform, which will be doing and, and generating constraints and configurations at different levels of organization, be they structural or function, functional in normal humans, and we will bring in from the reconfigured um, disease states abnormal values. We will be supplanting the abnormal values into the normal model <laughs> and seeing how the normal then predicts what happens and seeing whether that correlates with what the clinical presentation was, the sort of reverse engineering in terms of a validation. So I, I think I've come to the, to the end. I thank you very much for listening. The, my two colleagues who, who sort of generated this program, to which I contributed the medical side, are Henry Markram and Karl Heinz Meyer. Um, in the group that runs the medical informatics pl platform, um, there's the imaging component with Bogdan Dragansky, and also the computing component run by Anastasia Ailamaki, and the data handling and data analysis run by Ferrat Karif at the EPFL and at uh, the University of Lausanne. Thank you very much indeed. you with the text that you can just copy paste into your consent form and make sure that in the future you'll be able to share your data publicly for any retrospective and prospective uses. So you can talk to me later, I can give you the link to the consent form. 
But I've got two questions related to, to what you were talking at, at, at length. Yeah. Um, so but let me just begin. Like I, I agree that but this just differential. Tell us who, who has done this? The INCF. Uh, INCF was was helping. That was work done by me. But at who is Stanford. us? Just, just advertise yourself fully. Oh, my name is Chris Kurgoleski. I work at Stanford. I was worked on with the INCF data sharing group. Um, okay, so names aside, uh, I agree that differential privacy uh, is, is the way to go, and I don't see a different way uh, of yeah. doing this. But there are some limitations, and I'm trying, well, I'm curious how you're addressing them. So first of all, uh, the aggregation process will limit what kind of algorithms we'll be able to use. And not all of the, actually only a few machine learning approaches has been adapted to differential privacy. There's continuous work on that. And the second, maybe more important question well, is. should we deal with them one by one? OK, yeah, So, sure. th So the answer to your first one is this is an ongoing research project which has high ambition to innovate. And I absolutely agree with your statement. So we have a whole team which is working on data mining algorithms and how they must be adapted in order to. The top priority is data privacy. Why? One country, in fact two or three countries, in fact probably more in the world, have in the past killed members of their populations because of their medical records stating either their religious belief or their racial origin. So there are some countries who are extremely, extremely worried about anything coming out. In fact, there's one country which was involved with a pilot recently who crashed his plane and killed 150 people and there are still people in that country, lawyers, who say it was more important that his medical privacy was maintained than that it should have been told to his employers to prevent 150 people dying. So these are very significant and serious issues which we have to listen to and we have to take care of. But they are things which need to be resolved. We are moving now like a phalanx forwards and not like a single spearsman. So the data mining people have to solve these problems in parallel. We're working like the brain. Okay, excellent. Um, so my, my second question is a bit more of a kind of maintenance sustainability question. Mm. So in this approach, you put a lot of uh, demand on the hospital side. So then you have to maintain the infrastructure for aggregating the data and serving it to the next layer. And the question is, who's going to actually maintain this? Who's going to pay for it? How, how do you approach yeah. the hospitals? So, uh, so, so this was clearly a, a very significant issue at the beginning. So the principle that underlies our strategy is as follows. The, the hospitals themselves should have responsibility for the switching on and off the access in order to sustain their responsibility, of absolute responsibility for the integrity and for the privacy of the data. They re remain responsible for what they have in exactly the same way. They need to buy a server to serve the Human Brain Project, and they need to, with our help in the first instance, for the first five or six, in an R&D phase, we will co-fund the installation of the initial um, software which will be brought in from us in as, as an academic product, best academic product. When we show proof of principle, this will then be made available to entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs will have to transform this into industry-grade data, will have to get the certification from FDA and everyone else, and will then market th that service. Installation in hospitals. So that would be a great wealth generator and a great job generator. Next, everyone will need to be as much as possible, probably more than we are with our iPhones, will have to have the, an up-to-date set of apps. So there will be a second business opportunity, which will be an HPP app store, which will be maintaining and everything will be run as much as possible on the principle of, of apps which update as, uh, as the software is developed on the academic side and then transferred into industry standard and then into the hospitals. So this is, <coughs> this is a process which is not just academe dependent. It's academe industry dependent. The only people who've done that so far are Facebook, Google, Apple, and so on. There's no reason why, given that they've done it, why we shouldn't do it. I mean, for once, we're really pissed off that we're not first. 
but I, there's one thing I, okay, sorry. Glad to take any Thank you. Yeah, I only talked for 40 minutes and you gave me 50. I gave you 50 minutes. No, you didn't. I, I looked on my computer. It's only 38 minutes and 56 I, seconds. My iPhone doesn't lie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, with the next speaker, uh, unfortunately, he was not able to attend.